<laughs> and uh, even more interestingly, the way culture can affect um, uh, social structure through behavior matching, which has also been from talking about, and symbolic marking, which is uh, sort of the basis of the question I asked Di a few minutes ago. Okay. So it's this interaction that I'm going to talk about and that we are interested in. Uh, this is Maurizio's version of it. So he sees this um, relationship between within the network sphere of I individuals and relationships and uh, at a higher level between social learning and social structure, and then relationships back and forth between them. So um, we're going, looking at this um, relationship. So I'm going to start with this one, social structures affecting um, uh, learning and how social structure affects culture. Uh, and what I'm going to do is Pr present a few result, uh, some results from a, a, um, a, a modeling um, study that I did with David Lousseau, and then um, get into the ways. So, um, if the ties in your network represent the probability or rate that animals learn from one another, then network analysis may tell us about the propagation and distribution of culture. And if these rates, the rates that animals learn from one another, are proportional to the time they spend together. Then we can use simple association indices, which lies in this. Um, so um, what we were interested in is behavioral diversity. So how does the diversity of behavior change with network topology? And, and we tried a whole range of things. We used <coughs> continuous or categorically valued traits. We had them transmitted in different ways, different kinds of social learning. And uh, we had networks with different modularities of, of two different kinds. One unit base where the individuals formed social units which had various degrees of interaction with other social units. And spatially based where individuals had home ranges which overlapped in different ways. So by changing the rate at which the units interact or the sizes of the home range, you can increase or decrease the modularity. So um, basically, we ended up with each sort of set of runs, something like this, where modularity increases. And we see how where behavioral diversity changes. Um, and in this, uh, so this is a modularity of, I think, 0.1. And here's a modularity of about 0.7. And, uh, and this summarizes a, a lot of the different results of this. The key element here is that as modularity increases in all these scenarios, then diversity increases, as, as one might expect. But one thing that struck us was that there's a sort of level of about 0.3 at which nothing much happens. So you've got to get to about 0.3 before the behavioral diversity in the population changes. So um, greater than point. So sometimes in some scenarios, it has to be quite a lot bigger than that, but about there. And that's exactly where Newman suggested that important divisions appear in society. So um, if we think about the elements of culture that it's shared by members of community, um, then when modularity gets to be about, about 0.3 in the population, social structure outweighs the homogenization through social learning. So you start to get these shared communities with different cultures. Um, and of course, that means that social structure has a dominant effect on the diversity of cultural behavior, as we might expect. OK. so. Um, there have been a number of other studies of this kind of nature. They've been more in, in interested in the speed of cultural evolution on, on networks of different kinds. And obviously, it affects that. It also affects diversity. So in some ways, network topology produces culture.
don't tell them for about 20 minutes. But. <laughs> and those of you who, I don't know, maybe I'm the oldest person here, but this was um, one of the very best-selling records in the early 1970s. I remember, blissed out my dorm room listening <laughs> to the song of the whole background. <laughs> Maybe nobody else did. <laughs> it, ha it, it, it had a major effect on all kinds of things. <laughs> but the key element, the song of the humpback whale, it, it, it's, it's a truly um, beautiful thing to many of us, but it's, a, it's also fascinating from a scientific point of view. Sung by males on and near the mating grounds in winter, has range of a tens of kilometers, it's very loud, um, it cycles with a period of 7 to 25 minutes, um, but the whales can go on singing for a day or more. It just, just each cycles about that. Um, it's made of an orderly sequence of about eight distinctive themes. We go through them, we start at the beginning. Um, all males on a breeding ground sing the same song. So theme one is the same for all the males on a breeding ground at a particular time. Theme two and so on, and the order's the same. Uh, but the song evolves slowly over months and years. So. A month later, this one may have changed a bit. A year later, that one may have dropped out. And something else comes in and so on. So, um, now I, I'm going to use this as a rather strange example of how networks affect culture, but I think it's really fun. Uh, so, in, 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 um, I'm thinking of the social network of singing humpback whales, and in this case, the nodes are not the individual whales. They're all the males on a particular breeding ground. Um, so the males on, breeding, on a breeding ground, which are about 100 kilometers across, are in acoustic contact. Males on different breeding grounds may be connected by intermediate singers in the ocean between or long-range transmissions. Some may have got into some strange bit of oceanography and gone all the way over there. Or maybe occasionally move, uh, 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 males may move from one to the other. Now, in the Pacific, uh, this, these are the main breeding grounds of the humpback whales in the North Pacific. So they sing uh, south of Japan, of Hawaii, Mexico, Costa Rica in the winter. In the summer, they go to Alaska um, and Fiji. So it's the same as the birds. It's, they all leave Hawaii and head up to Alaska for the summer. Now, uh, the song, the song in the um, in all these areas is the same and evolves at the same time. So this is a big puzzle. How is this evolving in parallel with that? Well, we don't know, but it, it's pretty neat. <laughs> but even more neat is in the South Pacific. So what's happening here is again we've got a bunch of breeding grounds. This one's actually the same, but it's six months out of phase, so there's some animals go to Costa Rica. Uh, this time of year, they go to Alaska, some uh, in September, they're down in the Antarctic at the moment. Um, and and the, these other breeding grounds, and they're totally different contents, the songs, there's no connection between them. The North Pacific locations, as I mentioned, have synchronous evolution. The South Pacific locations have se sequential evolution. So a, a really neat paper by Ellen Garland and her colleagues. So these show the songs moving across. So this is Australia. Uh, this is French Polynesia. So this song takes about four years to move across the South Pacific. Um, and why it's going from uh, west to east, I don't know. But if we think about it, uh, Eurasia is about the same. This is about from Paris to Beijing. And uh, culture was mostly going westward through most of history. But in the uh, 18th and 19th century, it started going the other way, westwards across Eurasia. And the reasons for that are incredibly complicated, as I suspect for the reasons for what's going on here. Um, and this is a, a small um, subset of what's known as the Australian Revolution. Um, which happened in 1996 when the scientists working here suddenly noticed some really weird songs as the whales um, came north in 97. And when they came south after the, uh, uh, after the winter season, they were all singing the weird songs. Well, they wondered what had happened. Why had there been a change? 
Well, in fact, this was the Indian Ocean song, and the assumption is that some um, humpbacks came with the wrong side of Australia, sung their native song, and everyone thought it was great. It was, it's, it's like the Beatles coming to North America in the 60s and all the American bands changing their tune to sound. So, uh, anyway, okay. So, um, we've got these, you know, extraordinary different patterns. This synchronous evolution here, and it's... Uh, oh, can you? I have no idea. <laughs> yes, I, I can... Okay, so that's my strange example of how network topology um, can, can shape culture. Now let's look the other way. And I'm going to start by thinking about behavior of matching. And for this, I'm going to go to the bottom of those dolphins. And um, unfortunately, as you probably realize, uh, my work has lacks two of the main characteristics that Darren and Dick pointed out is really important to the study. There is no replication, and there is certainly no manipulation. Um, I have never done a successful experiment in my life, and <laughs> don't expect to do. Um, however, this is not real replication, but at least it's the same, well, it may not even be the same species, but it's probably the same <laughs> genus in three different locations. And uh, so uh, this is a really incredible uh, story. This happens in, in, in Laguna in Brazil, in fact in one other place in Brazil too, where uh, dolphins work cooperatively with fishermen and there's a set of signals that dolphins give the fishermen when they throw their nets, a set of signals that fishermen give the dolphins when they come in and this has been going on since about 1860 through many generations of, of, of dolphins passed down through the female line we think and through many generations of human fishermen passed down through the male line. Um, and, and in this area, in the same area, there are cooperative dolphins who work with the fishermen and those that don't. And their networks are pretty much discrete. Similarly, um, sponging, this strange bit in this where dolphins in Shark Bay put the sponge on their nose to go foraging at the bottom. Um, it ha only a subset of the animals do it, but they live with animals who don't do it. However, they preferentially associate um, with other sponges in the, the big circles of the sponges of the animals living in that location. Now, in both of these cases, we're not sure that the behavior is affecting the social structure, but the third case is a bit more convincing. Um, and these happen the other side of Australia, in Herbie Bay off Brisbane. And uh, a really neat uh, study published in uh, I think 2001 um, showed that there are a bunch of dolphins who follow shrimp tr trawlers and use the discard. And in the same area, there's some dolphins, same species, same area, who don't. And there's virtually no social contact between the non-trawler dolphins and the trawler dolphins. So two pretty dis discrete communities. And that's how it was left, except at the end of that paper, there was a, a thought, well, the managers are thinking of banning shrimp trawling. What's going to happen? And that was left hanging through most of the noughties for those of us interested in whale culture. So Inia Ansman published her paper uh, a couple of years ago where she went back, did the same study after the trawling had been banned. And now the two communities have got together. So this green one is that one. Uh, so and the, this one is this one. And so the trawler and non-trawler dolphins have got together, which uh, is, is still not conclusive, but is stronger evidence that the, uh, the communities here are based, at least to some extent, on behavior matching, animals associating with those who are doing the same thing. So uh, the, in all three of these papers, all published in 2012, the, the, the people suggest there is behavior matching going on. Um, but I think this one's the most convincing. Well, the third um, group I'm going to talk about is this one, conformism, symbolic marking. 
conformism is the increasingly likely adoption of a behavior as its frequency increases, so faster than linearly. Symbolic marking is the idea that cultural behavior acts as a marker of a social community. And both may increase segregation and modularity, especially if they're working together. So now I'm going to go to my own work on sperm whales. Um, and so just to summarize their social system, um, I'm going to talk just about the females. The males are another case. They're, they're diff well, the females in the tropics, the males in the Arctic and Antarctic. So it's a, a pretty well-divided <laughs> social system that way. Um, <laughs> The females are about 8 to 11 animals um, from a social unit. They're not all matrilineally related, so they're going around with animals who they are related to, who they aren't. They move together, they care for their calves together, they babysit their young together, they suckle each other's young, um, and if they're attacked, they defend themselves communally. So they have a very communal life. Um, but these units form groups with other units. So when we're at sea, we may run up against 20 whales or 30 whales, which would be two or three of these units. And we've noticed that the units have preferences for other particular units. Well, um, that's where it stood until we did an, uh, uh, a particular analysis of, uh, of these of communicative sounds made by sperm whales coders. These are patterned series of clicks used for communication. Not as beautiful as the humpback whale, but actually much easier to analyze. And in fact, what you heard there were two whales making coders with each other. In the end, they put them together as a kind of uh, way. So um, we. Uh, uh, we were looking at these coders and classifying them using various methods. And then this represents sort of the eureka moment of my scientific life. And I ran up the stairs of my awful concrete building. Um, so in, uh, this is Luke Randall, who worked with me on this one too. Um, look! Um, and so what, what this is, is these are the different coder types. So this is 2 plus 2, click, 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 click. And um, 7 armor, 7 regularly spaced. And these are the different social units or combinations of them. Um, and so uh, a, a circle means we heard that coda from that unit. A filled circle means it was over 10% of the repertoire. Over 10% of the codas we heard from that unit were from that. And the pattern here, which I clarified in color, is that there's a bunch of units here which make 5R, 6R, 7R, 8R. So regularly spaced codas. There's another bunch of units here in blue which make plus one coders. Uh, three plus one, four plus one, click, 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 click. Rather like the Canadian A at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then there's unit two, it's totally weird. Um, uh, so then we looked at these coders. Uh, the units could be classified into what we call three clans, regular plus one short. We found the repertoires of the units were stable over years. So if you're a plus one unit, you were still a plus one unit 10 years later. The units only form groups with units of their own uh, clan, even though they were all in the same area. There were consistencies in differences in behavior between clans. So the regular units were found close to the islands. They wiggled around. When you're following them, it's frustrating. They keep turning around. The plus ones were about 30 kilometers further from Galapagos Islands and would go in a straight line. Um, the, the regular clans had a higher feeding success most of the time, but when El Nino struck and life was bad for everyone, it's reversed, and now the plus one does better. Uh, there's differences in babysitting and so on. Well, we, um, we, we were found this fascinating. Then we looked at the genetics, and there's absolutely no difference in nuclear genes between the clans. So um, the conclusion is that, that, that what's happening here, of course it makes sense, is that the young sperm whale is learning her behavior, her repertoire, these other things from her mother and the other females in her social unit. 
So it is culture by our definition, and there seems to be conformism to the clan culture. So um, this is uh, a abbreviated version of what I showed earlier. This is just the uh, regular and plus one showing the similarities between the repertoires of the different social units. And they're both recorded here of the Galapagos. Um, and uh, this is from Luke Rendell's thesis work. And uh, after the thesis, he, he went on and he's now uh, uh, on the faculty at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And uh, he had a graduate student, uh, Ricardo Antunez, who went to do the same thing in the Atlantic. And um, OK, so that's the average difference between fans off the Galapagos. So w Ricardo had recordings from four different parts of the Atlantic. And he found a very different, and in fact, a much more expected pattern, where there were differences between areas, um, but usually ho homo homogenous, um, or nearly homogenous uh, repertoires between units in the same area. And uh, so he looked at the differences between the areas, and they were about there on the same scale. So there's a larger dis distinction between these two clans of the Galapagos than among these allopatric um, uh, populations in the Atlantic. And this indicates, again, we can't do experiments. We haven't got replication. So, but to me, it indicates that the, the, these coders are acting as symbolic markers of the community. And if you look at their structure, it can't, they're very clear, the differences, regular plus one. And, 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 and similarly with the other clans we know. There's a four plus clan in, in another part of the Pacific and so on. So sperm whale clans, uh, sperm whale so social units have nearly permanent membership. They associate with other units with common dialects, our clan, and do not associate with units with different dialects, our, the other clan. And so we're thinking that conformity and symbolic marking are exacerbating the net network structure here. So summarizing it, if we think of this as a distribution of behavior of individuals of the population, then the structure of the network affects this distribution of cultural behavior. This cult distribution of cultural behavior through behavior matching can affect the structure of the network. And then if you have conformism and symbolic marking, it can, it, it, it can standardize the behavior and make the uh, units of the social structure much clearer and tighter. Anyway, that's um, what I had to say. And thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the, well, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, which has funded me for the last 30 odd years. And I hope I'll hear next week. They're going to fund me for another five years, but we'll see. <laughs> and the National Geographic Society, Luke, Ricardo, David, and Maurizio. Thank you.